Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but they doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Thank you to God's light for leading us in multiple services this morning. A smart preacher would say, man, wasn't Esty's sermon good, and y'all, we'd move on with our morning. <laughs> Too bad I'm not smart. <laughs> we are finishing up the art of neighboring. This is our third week, art of neighboring and the importance of being a good neighbor. Being a good neighbor is in the DNA of Christians. Amen? Amen? If we're not a good neighbor, if we're not loving, if we're not kind, if we're not taking care of our neighbors, we can't be called Christians. If we're not embracing those around us, if we're not sharing the love of God, if we're not creating space through grace. We can't be Christ followers. We're going to dig in to the art of neighboring today and talking about ways of being the neighborhood. But I also want you to hear some of the stories that have come to me over the course of the past week. I'm gonna share some emails with you, I'm gonna share some, some texts with you, and I'm gonna share some calls with you and an in-person conversation, because I want you to see what's happening around us and to experience it. But before I do that, I want to tell you of a text I got last week before I even got out of the building. Do you remember the message last week that Jesus, this is Jesus' neighborhood, Jesus sets the rules, that, that all are welcome, remember? That, that Jesus tells us to love our neighbor, to love one another, and those are the God rules, those are the rules. I got a text message from a church member, from someone who was in worship, who, who grew up here. I need, to, I need to set this up right. Who grew up in this church, whose family is a part of this church. And this is the text said, I honestly didn't realize how badly I needed to hear that until after the service because I didn't really know it for myself. Let me say it better. A, a, a child who grew up here realized in worship that she's always questioned whether or not she belonged. This is the third time I've told this story, and I'm going to say it a little bit differently now because it's hitting me different than it hit me in the first two. If a child grew up here, one child, and wondered whether or not she fit, and that doesn't bother you, the rest of this ain't going to mean anything to you either. So let me tell you a story. This is not a Smyrna First story. This is a previous church story. You do not know these people. It was after church one Sunday about this time of the year, and a, and a guy came to me, a high school student, came to me at the very back, and he said, I need to get on your calendar. I need to spend some time with you today. I said, well, I don't have plans for lunch. You want to go to lunch with us? No, 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 I've, I've got lunch plans, but it's got to be today. And so we met later in the day and met in my office. And he said this to me. He said, I've got to have a conversation with my dad. I've got to tell him something, and it's got to be today. And I've got to tell him today, and it's, it's going to be bad, Derek. It's going to go badly. He's not going to take it well. And it, may, it will change our relationship forever, and it may, be, it may end our relationship. I, I think he's going to be so mad and so hurt that I think... Okay, 
here we go. I said, his name, what do you need to tell your dad? And I braced, like you're bracing right now. He said, I don't want to play football anymore. <laughs> I'm going to quit football, and i got to tell him today. And then I remembered, then I remembered that this kid, his dad was a local business owner. And when you went to high school football games, his dad's business, his dad's business had a banner everywhere you went. He was one of the leading contributors to the football program, to the booster club. I mean, everywhere was a banner. He had put money into the program, and his kid was a quarterback in middle school, and he was the quarterback of the ninth grade football team, and his dad had expectations about what was about to happen. And the boy knew it. And I said, I, I can't tell your dad, but I can sit with you when you do. We I'll do that. We can do that together. And then the next morning at Waffle House, Waffle House heals everything, <laughs> we had that conversation. We had that conversation. And his dad was upset. He was mad. I hope in those moments I handle it better. But it was handled. It was a couple of years later, standing at that back door again, and this was eerie how similar it was, standing at the back door of that church, this man, you know him, you don't know him, but you know him because his son just quit football. Remember him? He said, I really need to talk to you, and it's got to be today. Okay. You want to do lunch? Well, no, no, I've got lunch plans. I mean, it really was the same conversation. Can it be later in the day? And so we sat in my office right where I sat with his son a couple years earlier, and he looked at me and said, well, I'm leaving my wife. We're getting a divorce. He said... This is going to come out, so I might as well tell you, I'm already seeing someone, and she's already seeing someone, too. Will you tell my son for me? <laughs> I'm glad you found it funny. I mean, it was pretty horrifying for me. I said, no, I, I can't do that. I said, we can sit down, and then with your wife, and then we can... I tell you that to tell you this. Those conversations and that level of anxiety used to be far and few between in church life. That level of stress and anxiety, it's everywhere now. The, the stress and the fear and the anxiety and the anger, your staff and your clergy deal with it almost every day. That's the world we do ministry in. That's the world that we walk into. So now I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. It is important, it is crucial that we be people of peace. It is urgent that as Christians, as followers of Christ, in the midst of all this hurt and anger and angst, I cannot tell you how many families and how many people I'm sitting with right now where the homes are arguing with one another, where families are being split. It is imperative that we be people of peace. And I'll say more about that in the sermon as I deal with the text. As Christians, we believe that our faith should make us good neighbors. I got this email on Monday. Dear preacher, thanks for your message Sunday and your letter. Actually, it was Wednesday. Thank you for your message Sunday and your letter. Yesterday on my way to the golf course, Joe Mullins and the Radio Rangers came on the Bluegrass Channel, which tells you he has good taste in music. I recommend that you listen to it this week. It's a fairly old song, but the lyrics speak to what you've been preaching about most of the year, loving God and loving our neighbor. It is named Be Jesus to Someone Today. While I would not assume or attempt the status, the lyrics did speak to me. I hope they will help you through your day. Be Jesus to someone today. Is what you're listening to on a daily basis, an hourly basis, is it helping you be Jesus to someone today? Are you finding yourself listening to music or 
or podcast or, or whatever that's coming into your life, that's coming into your heart? Is it something that's encouraging you to be Jesus to someone today? It is, is it encouraging you to be someone who's kind, Christian? Or are you allowing what's coming into your life, what's coming into your ears, what's coming into your heart and soul to just make you matter? There's enough of that. On Wednesday night, it was so awesome watching Gary and Rebecca lead the team and to see these folks who've been volunteering for years now. Marty was standing at a table with me and she said, Derek, this is so great. People who've not been volunteering tonight were volunteering and serving and coming alongside. This energy tonight, maybe we should have froze spending a long time ago. The donuts are coming back, take a deep breath. But that community, that energy, that joy with one another, that that's really the purpose of Wednesday night. It's not just to eat as good as the food is. It's to be with one another. It's to have a break in the middle of the week so that you're with your Christian family, so that you're with your brothers and sisters and able to and have community. And dare I say it, communion. And then Thursday, about 11 o'clock, I got a phone call from a member who said they were backing out of their driveway and they were leaving and they noticed their neighbor across the street waving at them. Does your neighbor wave at you when you pull out of the driveway? This neighbor said she'd never done that before, but I thought, well, maybe she's going to our church and I didn't know it. And so I waved back. Maybe they're trying to be a good neighbor. And then I got turned around and they're still waving at me. And I thought, well, this is awkward. This is weird. This is a little over the top. You can quit waving now. But I remembered the sermon. I remembered the message to be a good neighbor. And I waved back again. And as I was pulling out, I noticed she was still waving. And I thought, and I thought, well, I don't want to be a preacher. I don't want to be the priest or the Levite. I should stop. And he said, I got out and I felt really good about myself because here I was living it out. I got out and I went up to her and she said, thank you so much for stopping. My 92-year-old father has fallen inside and I couldn't help him get up by himself. Will you help me? She wasn't waving at him. She was waving him down. And he said, I spent five or six, maybe seven minutes in the house with him, and I helped him get up. I helped him get situated. He said, but that blessing that I had, this being a neighbor, this art of neighboring, I won't have a better blessing this week, the ability to see her face and to reach out and to connect. It was, he said, it was powerful. And then yesterday morning, I got this email. Pastor Derek. My neighbor and her husband have lived across the street from me for about 20 years. We became close to each other right from the get-go. One reason she is special to me is that when I told her that I was going to be reading the book of Psalms one per day, she asked if she could read along with me. We communicate by text message every morning. After we have each read the psalm for the day, we text what our reactions are or what the study notes teach. Today we have each read Psalm 17. Have you ever heard of any other partner reading church member to neighbor? I'll bet that is a rare occurrence. The other reason that my friend is such a great friend and neighbor is they have enthusiastically signed on as my new primary health care agent. The woman who previously held this position can no longer serve. Her 95-year-old mother now needs lots of attention. Plus, her sister has been diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. Both relatives live out of state. These developments left me in a pickle. Who would ever come to my rescue if I needed help? Miraculously, my neighbors have saved the day. They tell me now that I have a family. Isn't this story living proof of how valuable and precious a neighbor can be? Doesn't this story fit very well into your neighbor sermon series? God bless you, Pastor Derek. I knew it on Monday, and I even said it to the staff before all of these, that being a great neighbor requires two people. It requires a neighbor who will stop, who will help. But it also requires a boldness to be vulnerable. Let me say it again. To be a good neighbor requires a boldness to be vulnerable. Great neighbors require both sides of the street. Renee Brown says it like this in The Gifts of Imperfection. Until we can receive with an open heart, we never really give with an open heart. 
When we attach judgment to receiving help, we knowingly or unknowingly attach judgment to giving help. So whenever we receive and we attach judgment on ourselves, when we criticize ourselves or when we are negative towards ourselves for needing to ask and having to receive, what it tells us about our own heart and soul is that when we give, we're never really giving with a full and open heart. Our heart is tainted. Being a great neighbor is found in the ability to receive help from the neighborhood. The best neighborhoods are found in their abilities to share with one another. The best neighborhoods are always found to be strong in their sharing. Scripturally, maybe you've already begun to think of the book Church in Acts, Acts 2, 43 through 47, where it says all came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. And here it is. Praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. The goodwill of all the people. The goodwill of all the people. As we go through this, we can automatically think of people that we don't think deserve goodwill. And sitting in the sanctuary, we ought to be honest before God. There are people that we're not comfortable getting goodwill from God. In the early church in Acts, what it meant and what it showed to be a good neighbor and to be a good neighborhood is that all received goodwill. All received good will. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Brothers and sisters, the way that we love our neighbors is the source of multiplication and growth. Church vitality and church growth is always impacted by the way that we love our neighbors. And to be a healthy church, to be a healthy and vibrant church always comes down to are we loving our neighbors? Can I come back to it? We cannot be Christ followers if we are not loving our neighbors. The way that we treat our neighbors, the way that we love our neighbors is the source of multiplication and growth, not just in our neighborhood, but in our church and community. The way that we treat our neighbors and those around us may be the only way that our neighbors experience Jesus. The people that you meet in the grocery store, in your office at work, in your home, for many of them, it will be the only experience they have, the only opportunity that they have to experience the love, the neighbor, loving, adoring power of Christ. And so what did these people have in common? In Matthew 10, 11, when Jesus is sending out the disciples, because it says in the beginning of the text that we read that to the end of the age, Jesus was doing this and the great commission to go make disciples. When you see in chapter 10, verse 11, when Jesus is sending out the 12 and then the 70 and then the 100, when he's sending them out, when he's sending them out, he says to them, whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. Well, the immediate question is, is what does it mean to be worthy? How, how can you be worthy? How, how, how is worthy measured there? In our world, you, we know what worthy means. Do they have a guest room or am I going to have to sleep on the couch? How, how good is the food going to be? I mean, is there a dog? Is there a cat? I mean, am I going to be able to be comfortable? That's our view. That's our world of worthy. And so as I was digging into it, I thought, well, where else, what other gospel has this story? And Luke tells the same story in chapter 10, verse 6. And when Luke lays it out and he says, go into the town or village, find someone who is a person of peace. How many persons of peace do you have in your life? Can you name five? This isn't a judgment thing, and don't raise your hand. 
But can right now you think of five people who are persons of peace that are walking through your life and walking through the life of the community and the church and the school and work around you that are working towards peace? You got a lot of righteously indignation people in your life, just like I do. Just like I do. Who we have been taught and trained that it's more important than what I believe than what I do. But to be a person of peace, to be able to engage, to walk in and love. And here's what defines our peace. Here's where it defines our peace and where our peace comes from as Christians. C.S. Lewis says it this way. I find that when I think I'm asking God to forgive me, I am often asking him to do something quite different. I am asking him not to forgive me, but to excuse me. But there is all the difference in the world between forgiving and excusing. Forgiveness says, yes, you have done this thing, but I accept your apology. I will never hold it against you, and everything between us will be exactly as it was before. But excusing says, I see that you couldn't help it or didn't mean it. You weren't really to blame. If one was not really to blame, then there is nothing to forgive. What we call asking God's forgiveness very often really consists in asking God to accept our excuses. To excuse can, what can really produce good excuses is not Christian charity, it is only fairness. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. To be a person of peace means to be someone who goes into the world who carries the peace of forgiveness from God and the joy in their heart and the love of Christ and the love of one another and you can't wait to talk to your neighbor to tell them just how good God is. To tell them that you may have made mistakes or there may be problems, there may be struggles, there may be shortcomings, but let me tell you what God can do for you and offer that peace and offer that joy. In Luke 14, Jesus is asked to describe the kingdom, and he says it like this. He says, the kingdom of God is like this. There was a man who was throwing a party. Do you remember the text? Do you remember the story of the parable of the great dinner? There was a man who was throwing a party. And so the man took his servant, and he said, go out and invite everyone. Go out into the fields. Go out everywhere into the streets and invite everyone to my party. And so the servant goes out, and he begins to invite, and he comes up on one person, and they say, I, I got some property, I got, I got some business I got to take care of. I can't make it. Another one he goes to and says, well, I got some family stuff I got to take care of. I, I, I can't make it. And the servant keeps going and inviting, and everyone keeps turning him down, and everyone keeps saying no, no. And so finally the servant goes back to the man, and, the, and he tells the man, no one's coming. And what does the man say? We'll call it off. We'll just go home. That's not what he says, is it? He says, you go out and you find the cripple, the lame, the last, the lost, the least. You go out and you invite. You go out and invite the ones that no one else is inviting. You go out and grab the ones that everyone else is looking past. You go and find those that the world has ignored and forgotten and left for dead. And you bring them and you continue to bring them until there is nowhere else to sit. You continue to bring them until there is nowhere else to be that the house and the table will be so full, it'll be overflowing. As a person of peace, you bring them to this hospital. You bring them to this hospital where we can all be healed. To be a person of peace means to give you the peace to say, if this is the decision that you need to make, I support you. I love you. To be a person of peace means that wherever you go, I'm going to love you. Whatever you do, I'm going to love you. I'm going to hold you in my heart no matter what. To be a person of peace means everything, 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 everything is centered on goodwill to all. Not some, not many, not most. All. Jesus Christ died for all. And this text feels tough right now, doesn't it? This text feels difficult right now, this whole person of peace thing. Do you remember what happened right after Jesus is teaching this? 
Do you remember the reality of the world? Jesus, as he's gathered these 11 disciples, as he's got these disciples together and telling them the Great Commission, he knows what's going to happen next, that he's going to be arrested, that he's going to be beaten, scourged, lynched, killed, and that his disciples are going to be staring at a black wall into the abyss thinking, what was all this? Be people of peace, Jesus is teaching. Be people of joy and forgiveness and hope. And it'll change the world. And brothers and sisters, it is the only thing that ever has changed the world for good. Be a good neighbor. Be someone who is a person of peace. And here's how it walks out. We believe in Sunday school here. We especially believe in children's and student Sunday school here. Did you know that that's a trend that a lot of churches are going away from? Now, I'm not criticizing other churches. Let me get that out of here real clear. I'm not criticizing other churches. We had the conversation here. It's easier. It's easier to not have kids Sunday school. For one, families don't want to give you two hours a week. And some of the families are shaking their head, amen. We've got a lot of stuff going on. We also have a hard time getting volunteers. Did you hear, Esty? It's hard to get volunteers. But here's why Sunday school matters. It's not just so your kids can learn the Jesus stories. That's really important. It's not just so that the children can hear, learn the Old Testament. That's really important. It's because we don't want this to be just another stop in your week. And if we make it easier, it just becomes another stop in your week. We want this to be the place that forms all the other places that you go. We want the peace that lives here through Jesus Christ to travel with you into all the other places that you go. And the best way to make sure that happened is to have you as a volunteer in there teaching these children, discipling the children who are walking through life with your children, partnering with other parents, working with other parents to share that peace, to share that love, to be a community of purpose where you're gathering and joining together and working together and coming together and forming that community. Because in that community of purpose, of teaching our kids about Jesus Christ, of God coming together, all begin to matter. And when you come together and you work together and you get to know one another and you get to know one another's kids and you gather together and you love together and you raise up and you grow up together, that is church. That's church life and church family and what it means to be a neighbor. So for us, we want to make sure there's plenty of opportunities not only for you to learn about Jesus, but for you to work together and serve together and have community together and join together. Are you catching a word? Together. 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 Amen.